Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. James Gill and you've joined me for another clinical skills video. Today we're going to be looking at the Rinnies and Weber's tests which allow us to assess hearing loss in a patient. So when it comes to hearing there are three types of hearing loss. There is the conductive hearing loss as mentioned, the sensory neural hearing loss and also a mixed form. Conductive hearing loss is essentially a blocked ear, so whether or not that's glue ear from otitis media, or problems with the ossicles, the bones in the ear, or heck, even straightforward earwax. There is something blocking the transmission of sound into the ear and then its propagation through to the hearing apparatus. So sensory neural hearing loss, that's when you've got damage to the nerves. So somewhere between the brain and the actual hearing apparatus itself, there is a problem. That can be due to a tumour, excessive noise, uh, potentially old age, and also certain medications such as gentamicin can cause ototoxicity, damaging the hearing apparatus, the nerve side of things. We've also got mixed hearing loss, which is a combination of conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. And that's kind of self-explanatory, really. The Weber's and Rinnies test is used for assessing hearing loss and allowing us to determine if this is a conductive hearing loss or whether or not we've got a sensory neural hearing loss. Given we can identify both features, it will also allow us to determine if we've got a mixed hearing loss as well. However, whilst the Weber's and Rinnies test is focused on unilateral hearing loss, bilateral hearing loss is a much more complicated issue and that will need assessment via ENT and with specific audiology hearing tests to determine the cause. That said, it's important to stress that the Weber's and hearing tests are a crucial part of the cranial nerve examination and shouldn't be assessed on their own. But today we're going to extricate those two examinations from the cranial nerves as a whole because it's often an area that students find challenging. So we're going to dig into how we do the Weber's and Rinnies test and also their interpretation. With that in mind, here's a guide to trying to do things properly, but within the context of the cranial nerves overall. When it comes to tuning forks, you can buy a whole orchestra's worth of frequencies but we specifically want to be using only two tuning forks in clinical practice. That's the 512 uh, hertz fork, and that will be used for auditory testing, and also the 128 hertz fork, and that will be used for testing vibration sense. Now, there is a halfway house, of course. We can use a 250 hertz fork. That's adequate to test vibration sense, and it's adequate to do an auditory assessment. But we're not looking for adequate here, we're looking for excellence. So for that reason, we're only going to be using the correct 512 hertz fork for the assessment we're going to do today. So we've just discussed why we need to uh, use the 512 hertz fork and what it is we're going to use that for when we're doing Weber's and Rinnie's test. But it's crucial to remember that that particular test should only be done as part of the cranial nerve examination. So, as ever, we're going to make sure we gel our hands. So, in terms of doing that, hello Abby, uh, my name's Dr Gill. Um, I've been asked to have a look at uh, your hearing today using one of the tuning forks. So that's going to involve in placing the tuning fork on your head, beside your ears, and also getting you to listen to it. Is that okay? Yeah. So, before we start, could we please confirm your name and date of birth? Abby Thut, the 7th of December 96. Thank you. So we've got the 512 hertz fork. I'm going to strike it on the back of my wrist. I'm going to place it in the centre of Abby's forehead. So Abby, you can hear the noise inside your head. Is it to the left ear, the right ear, or are you hearing it mainly in the middle? Uh, in the middle. Perfect. So that's exactly what we want for that first part of the test for Weber's, because that suggests that there's actually no problems going on here. If, however, she'd heard the noise louder toward one ear or the other, then we need to clarify what's going on with our Rinnies test. So we do the same again. I'm going to strike the tuning fork. And if you could just move your uh, hair back for me. So I'm going to place this on the back of your head. So can you hear that noise there? Yeah. Okay. Tell me when it disappears. Stop. Okay, I'm going to bring that round and place that in front of your ear. So can you hear it now? Yeah. Superb, thank you. So what we're looking there is the difference between air conduction and bone conduction. So by placing it on um, the back of Abby's head on a mastoid process, we're going to be 
hearing the sound through the bones of the ear. However, that's not going to be as good as hearing it through air. So we lose the sound first from the, uh, the bone conduction and we should then be able to hear it afterwards, in which case we've got a normal examination on this side. Let's do the same again on the opposite side. So if you can move your head, please, and place it on the back of the head there. So tell me when you can't hear the noise anymore. Stop. Okay, I'm going to bring it round. Can you hear it again here? Yeah. Super. So we've again confirmed that we have a normal Weber's, a normal Rinne's on both sides, so we have no issues with her hearing. And to clarify, when we're putting the tuning fork beside the ear, we're making sure that the prongs are directed toward the ear as the sound will propagate in that way. So thank you very much for that, Abby. Uh, we've confirmed that there's no problems with the hearing and we have a normal Weber's and Rinne's test. Before we go, do you have any questions for myself? No. Super. Well, thank you very much for your time today. So whilst the Webers and Rennes tests are a relatively easy test to perform, they do have somewhat complex analysis, which makes them quite high yield for medical examinations, whether or not that's written or OSCE assessments. So with that in mind, let's dig into how these examinations should be done. Now we're going to start with the Webers test. Uh, the best way of thinking about the Webers test is it's going to tell you whether you have a problem with your left or your right ear. We strike the tuning fork and we place it on the vertex or the centre of the patient's forehead. From here, the patient will hear or feel the vibration inside their head. Um, and in a normal patient with no problems with the hearing, that should be central inside the head. If, however, there's a problem, then that sound will deviate towards one side or the other. Now, the Rinne's test will be used to clarify what's exactly going on if we find that deviation, because there could be two things going on, as we're aware, a sensorineural loss or a conductive hearing loss. Now, when it comes to the Weber's test, a conductive hearing loss will have the sound going toward the affected ear. Conversely, with a sensorineural hearing loss, the um, sound will go away from the affected ear toward the healthy ear. The way I've always thought about this is that with a sensory hearing loss, your, your ears, your microphones aren't working as well. So what your body's doing is turning up the sensitivity on the affected ear, pulling that sound over to that one side. Conversely, with a conductive hearing loss, we've got sticky wax and that's sticking the sound onto that side as a way in my head of understanding why these two happen as they do. Now, with that in mind, we must do the Rinne's test to be able to determine which of the two is the problem here. Now, our hearing apparatus is designed to hear in the air. Funny that, what with us not being fish and all. But the point being is, the Rinne's test, we should be able to strike the tuning fork and place it on the mastoid process behind the ear. As the vibration lessens, we will lose being able to perceive the tone in the head, at which point we bring the tuning fork around with the sound propagating into the ear again, and because our air conduction is better than bone conduction, we should be able to hear the sound once again. The reason for this being that because we're designed to hear in the air, our ability to hear the tuning fork through air is much more sensitive than our ability to hear it through the sound conducted from the skull. To clarify, if we do Rinne's test on a patient with a blocked ear, so a conductive deficit, their bone conduction will be better than their air conduction as there is literally something blocking the ear. With regard to terminology, Air conduction being better than bone conduction, that's considered to be a positive Rinne's test. Conversely, bone conduction better than air conduction, that would be a negative Rinne's test. And that's quite important for how we're going to analyse these two. When it comes to assessing sensory neural hearing loss, say for example from age-related hearing loss, or an acoustic neuroma affecting the vestibular cochlear nerve, We'll start off with Weber's test. This will lateralise, but we need to contrast this with the Rinne's test to determine what is going on. With a sensory neural hearing loss, we'd find a positive Rinne's test on both sides, 
i.e. air conduction will be better than bone conduction. Thus, we would be able to confirm that the unaffected side, the side opposite to which the Weber's test had lateralized, was the one affected with the hearing loss. We can have a false negative Rinne's test, whereby someone has absolute hearing loss on one side, and it appears that they can hear, because actually what they're getting is the bone conduction going through the skull and stimulating the opposite ear. In many ways, I think it's better to show rather than tell. In which case, let's give you all a little bit of conductive hearing loss. Go grab something to eat, you know, some sweets, chocolate bar, or ideally crisps. Don't worry, I'll wait. Now, if you've got your crisps, food, whatever like that ready, put a finger into one ear. Okay. You've now created a conductive hearing loss in your left ear. Now put the food in your mouth and start to chew. As you do so, you'll hear the sound is much louder on the left side, or the side that you've got your finger in, than it is on the right. Because, as we've highlighted before, that conductive hearing loss will mean that bone conduction is better than air conduction. So if you remember nothing else from this video, please keep in mind, when you're doing Rinne's test, please make sure that you have the uh, tuning fork propagating the sound toward the patient's ear, rather than away. So with that in mind, I hope this has been a good overview on the Weber's and Rinne's test and how to correctly use your tuning fork for these. Obviously, the um, analysis of these is still relatively challenging, but hopefully you've got a much better understanding now. With that in mind, if you found this to be useful, please consider liking the video and giving us a comment down below on what else you'd like to see us dig deeper into. Take care, and we'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.